Okay, Stephen Gates. So I'm going to kick off our discussion by pointing out some of the direct influence you had on me. Uh, when, you, when you first launched The Crazy Ones, uh, there was an episode about personal branding and you gave the advice, identify your own personal archetype. So I went through this exercise. Uh, I, I hope you recall this. I, I think you should. Uh, there's about 25 or so of these. And um, after many discussions with people I know, people around me, I came back to artist and connector, which very much, I think, aligns with me doing these kinds of discussions with folks because I, I, I really love to talk with people. I could talk for hours and hours. Um, and I like talking about design. So uh, I'll just kick off by thanking you for that. Uh, <laughs> you, you have, you're like, a, what are you on, episode 78 or so, Crazy Ones? 70, I think 75 is what's been released publicly. Yeah, I've got about, I don't know what, 30 or 40 more in the works. But yeah, I think we're on, we're on 75 that's been released as of today. And you are, uh, you're hardcore, man. You just do this by yourself. You speak into a mic. That's, I mean, at least I get to, I get to, I get to talk to interesting people. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it's definitely, it's the harder road to go down whenever you decide you want to do a podcast, right? Because I, I think it, it's just you and you kind of have to pretend that there's an audience out there and no, but I just felt like, you know, look, there's so many other amazing podcasts out there and so many other people that were interviewing the people that I'd want to interview. And I just really wasn't sure that I felt like I could really do it justice as opposed to for me, you know, wanting to create something that was a little bit of that kind of like an inside outsider, right? Like that ability to kind of say, look, I've been there, I've done that. If I can kind of shorten somebody else's journey by what, what I've gone through, talk about stuff that maybe other people, you know, aren't quite as, as reticent or, or doesn't happen, you know, quite so easily for them, then that was the stuff that I, that, uh, I got really excited about. And I think, you know, it's a formula that's found an, an incredible response and audience. Uh, it is incredible. And um, I, you know, I, you and I, I think, yeah, I'm comparing, but we have different personalities clearly. And I, when I listen to your podcast, I just think this guy, you see, even when you're not so sure, you're, you're sure of yourself. Um, when you're talking through things like one, I listened to one of your later ones, which I'll, I'll get into, uh, in a minute, uh, about politics. And it, you know, as I was listening to this, it, it sounded like, you know, you're saying, well, I'm, you know, this is not your area. It, and it almost felt like you were talking to someone specifically. Um, but it, <laughs> like, I kind of felt like you were going through some. Um, some well, no, I, I think, you know, the, the interesting part about the podcast, I think, you know, honestly, is that it, it's, it's, it's a two sided thing, right? Like on the one hand, I do try to. I try to share what I've learned, whether it's something that I feel like I'm really good at or whether it's something that, you know, is a little bit harder. And I think, you know, the, the great part about it has been one, if I can share those things and it helps other people, unbelievable. But I, I think, you know, the other part of it for me is that it does, it's become a really interesting. And I think, you know, this is what my public speaking, what the podcast, what writing has sort of done is that I think it, it, it gives me the time and forces me to explore parts of my process, parts of my work. And then as I discover those things, by giving it away, it forces me forward. Because I'm going to stand on stage next year, next month, next whatever it is. I can't recycle what I've said in the podcast. I can't. So it forces me to keep exploring and to keep pushing. Yeah. And no, and, and I think, you know, there are. I mean, we've talked about, you know, emotion. We've talked about gender bias. We've talked about, uh, you know, a bunch of topics that I think are, are sort of hard to enter into. But, you know, I think that's, that's sort of why I like to be able to, the ability to do it is because it does let you have a conversation. Yeah. Um, and plus, I, I think one of the things I've learned doing this is like dialogue and conversation is a form of thinking. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. you, you work stuff out. So, um, all right. Well, I'm curious, though, as I was going through this process and I, I was kind of taking your advice, um, what would you say your archetype is? Because I, I have a couple ideas. Uh, for your, for your personal <laughs> brand. So, like, what what did you? I'm, I'm assuming you went through this exercise and narrowed it. I did. You know, it's funny. I, I haven't done it recently, and and I do think it it definitely changes with regularity and with different roles and with things like that. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I'd be curious. So let's, you know, for me, I haven't done it in a little while. I would say, 
you know, for my, my archetypes used to be more around sort of like the storyteller, the kind of like the visionary, kind of like the bigger picture, sort of like, you know, a little bit of the rebel sprinkled in and some of those things. Um, but, you know, but it's interesting because I haven't really done it since I've taken on my new role over the past year. I haven't kind of gone back and and rethought that. So I'd, I'd be curious. So what 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 do you think it is? And then, yeah, I can uh, let me give me a second to think about it. I think there's a couple in there. I see it's almost like you project rebel, like crazy one. That's that's got a rebel vibe. But, you know, if I'm listening to you, it's your, you know, leader ruler. It's it's like. Yeah. And these are, you know, much to my chagrin. I don't know if I have those qualities, you know, but um, I found myself like, so I remember, I think it was a Bill Clinton quote. He said, you know, people prefer strong and right than weak and wrong. Or sorry, they prefer strong and wrong to weak and right. Right. That's what I, sorry, I mixed that up. Yeah. Like, and and yeah, so I think so. Yeah. So anybody listening, I think just so you know what it is was so yeah, there was an exercise that I developed where in trying to build your personal brand, you know, Greek archetypes, it's one of the oldest forms of storytelling there is out there, right? Where you can go through and, and I generally use about 16 of these where you can go through and there are different character types in any story. And what I'll ask people to do is to be able to go through and you print all of them out and you sort of take two of them at a time, one in each hand reading each one of them, seeing which one do you feel like is probably the better descriptor of that, that, discarding the other one, doing it again and again until you kind of get to the end to be able to get to one of them. Um, it's also a fascinating exercise, and Dan, I think you sort of mentioned that, right, of like to do it yourself and what do you think and have other people do it because it's, it's often interesting the difference between the two. But no, I mean, I, you know, for me, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from a, a mentor of mine who, and it was a similar sort of quote, where he would describe leadership as your your ability to simply be the most confident, uncertain person, yes. and and, I, and that's always sort of stuck with me. Is that, and, and I think especially when we talk about creativity, we get so hung up on like this is where social media is just sort of screwing us up because we just we end up comparing our insides with everybody else's outsides, and it's a comparison you just can't win. Like you know, I'd love it for this year if everybody went for Halloween as who they pretend to be on social media, but <laughs> I, I think that you know there is some part of it of you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of it for me is my willingness to just sort of let it fly and to be able to kind of in the leader role or whatever that is, is to be able to say, okay, look, we're going this way. I believe this, we're going to talk about this. Yeah. Even if that evolves over time, because I think the thing that I discovered is while it is terrifying at first, as soon as you put that uncomfortable thing out there, as soon as you talk about that, I've seen it through the podcast, I've seen it through public speaking, I've seen it through leadership. As soon as you sort of let that vulnerability in, it's amazing how you get it back. 10 times better. And all the people are like, oh, finally somebody said it. And, and, you know, sort of acknowledging that stack of pink elephants. Yeah. I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. Like when I first kicked off this series, the people, you know, like yourself, and you probably remember, uh, cause I'm sure I projected this to a degree. Like I, I, I was just nervous talking to yeah. folks. Like, I mean, you can go down the list of people I've spoken to. We're, we're talking about CEOs, business leaders, big brand folks. Um, and you know this is i'm pushing my 30th one or so and the thing that i realized and this goes back to my archetype i think is just that um you know one of the things i'm very just natural at is i can have a conversation and i'm genuinely usually i'm genuinely interested in what right. people have to say which i know um some people have a rough a really rough time with that but uh just kind of identifying uh, that within myself yeah. um, and well, then I was but my point was I was really nervous at first then I started talking to these people and and everybody's just people at the end of the day yeah so, well I think that, that but that that was the whole point of what the crazy one was started about right because I think that was my own personal journey that's why I have the crazy the years of the crazy ones tattooed on my right arm was because you know I spent 30 plus years of my life in that same place, right? Of being nervous, of being unsure, of feeling like because I was different, somehow that was a weakness. And that yeah. it took me that long to realize that, no, that difference is actually a strength. And, it, and so many of the creatives I coach, so many of the leaders that I coach, so many of the teams that I work with, it's getting them to do just what, just what that process is, right? Of how do you make peace with yourself? How yeah. do you see the difference as a strength? How do you, and that was for me, what kind of became the battle cry of like, you know, staying crazy was it's, it's about embracing 
your uniqueness and being able to see the power in that and to stop trying to stand out by being the same. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's really tough. I mean, it's, it's like a simple concept, but not necessarily uh, an easy journey, you know? Well, yeah. Well, I think just like, just like anything, as you get into emotion and creativity, it, this is why we will write books on creativity, leadership, self-help and everything else until the end of time because it's also completely unique to each person. There, there's not a magic formula. It's like, yeah. you know, I get, so, I get so many creatives who come up and say like, what's your secret? And, and I'll say, you know, the, the, and I'll sort of stop them and I'll say like, you understand that your problem is going to be in the premise of that question because you want there to be a shortcut. You want it to be easy. You don't want it to be, and I think with a lot of creatives careers, that's what happens, right? Is that our talent can carry us so far. Yeah. And then you hit that point where all you're left with are sort of the things that were stuffed in the dark corners that become harder to deal with, that are more personal, that, that are those sort of things you need to take on and make peace with. And that a lot of companies, a lot of teams don't necessarily understand how to deal with those moments. Yeah. Well, it's ironic, especially you talk about branding, emotional connection. That's what branding is and how, how I think businesses have such a rough time. You know, when I do brand briefs with folks, they, that the what's the emotional connection to your audience that that's always draws a blank when, when I'm going through these right because uh, yeah, I mean, I mean it, it always it may sound a little you know because I, I think it's the way I've approached building my brand it's the way I've approached building a lot of really big brands and it, it always sounds strange whenever you first hear it but for me it's like I always want to build a brand that somebody hates because I think that it, it is a brand that stands for something that is strong enough and is clear enough that somebody says, you know what, that's not for me. As opposed to everybody who's like, look, I want everybody to like me. I want everybody to love me. I want, and, and I think, you know, especially whenever it comes like, to yourself, like it's hard, it's hard just to plant that flag and say, I, I think. I was just going to say, that's like a uh, first person comes to mind is Donald Trump, right? I mean, this guy <laughs> built a brand. He doesn't seem to care about it people hating him, right? In fact, right. And again, I think that's, that's certainly the extreme example. I'm certainly not abdicating that because again, I, I think that there is at, at some point, yeah, how much of your consumer base you decide you want to alienate. But I think, you know, for me, like whenever I build, like whenever we worked on W Hotels, W is not for everybody. Some people love the vibe. Some people thought it was Sodom and Gomorrah, like and everything else in between. But I think, you know, it had a clear enough focus and, and the, the brand was clear enough about what it was that whenever you walked in, you just said, wow, I really love this, or wow, I aspire to be this, or, you know, I, I'd want to go stay at one of the other brands that maybe is a little bit quieter and kind of calmer. Yeah. So since I, since I first met you, you've had, you know, we're talking about W, and uh, you've had multiple leadership roles. Uh, yes. Starwood, you went on to City, now you're with Envision. Um, you know, and I, what you just said about building a brand people hate, I, I'm curious, I've not, I haven't, I've yet to run into somebody who hates Envision, but um, can you <laughs> talk about your journey and how you've like navigated through uh, all these changes? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it for me, so I was, my father was a creative director. Um, I started my design education whenever I was two years old on a cast iron letterpress in my parents' basement. You know, I've been a paid designer since I was 12. I worked for McCann Erickson and a bunch of other ones. And yeah, about, ooh, I don't know what it was, 13, 14 years ago. Um, decided that I was going to go to in-house. And I think, you know, that was very much before that had sort of become a thing. And it was sort of like, okay, great. You're going to go sunset your career or whatever that was. And so I did, I, um, I just, I was working in Texas at the time at an agency and decided I wanted to come back to New York, um, was approached by Star Hotels. They said, look, you know, we really want to modernize what we're doing. We want to kind of, we need people to be able to kind of lead this change. And confused all of my friends and went to work for a hotel brand. And it was really funny because I think for the first three or four years, you're on this leadership path and you can see something that others don't. And people kept telling me I was crazy and what was I doing and why I didn't come back to agency work. And then a funny thing happened whenever your work shows up in an Apple keynote. And then, and then it shows up in about seven more while you work there, right? Then all of a sudden everybody wants to know if you're hiring. Um, and so, yeah, I spent nine, almost nine years at Starwood building um, the global brand design and innovation team there. Um, really focusing on digital. We did a lot around mobile check-in, around keyless entry. Uh, we were one of the first teams that got to work on Apple Watch, did a lot of really cool stuff there. And I think, you know, really started to show what could an in-house team do. Wow. Um, I, I think obviously with their transition over to being bought by Marriott, I decided it was probably a, a better time for me to go explore something different. 
um, you know, Citibank was it was a fascinating experiment in really in an even older company because it was kind of the first serious global head of design role that they'd ever had in the 210 year history of the company. First sort of centralized design team, um, you know, big, you know, 300,000 person company, really, really big challenge. So, you know, again, I think that was a, a fascinating look at how do you get in and start to be able to build something like that, be able to turn a ship that big. Um, and yeah, and I think it was honestly just through a, um, a happenstance conversation I had with Clark, who's the CEO in Envision. If you ever going to get emails from Clark from Envision, he is a real guy. He is the CEO. Um, where we just ended up having this conversation and he just said, look, you know, what, what do you think the industry needs? And, and I said, look, you know, I feel like we're in this real moment where as creatives, we have the ability to affect business in ways we haven't seen since the industrial revolution. And, but I see so many leaders, I see so many teams who can't figure out how to take advantage of it. And, you know, so for me, there's a real intersection of how do we bring credible experience into these companies to help them elevate the impact of design. And he just kind of smiled and said, look, I completely agree. Can you write a job description for what it would be to go do that? And I was like, ah, oh, crap. Um, so, yeah, so I've been here about 11 months. Um, you'll be coming up on a year next month where it really is about going out and evangelizing design, working with, you know, I'm, we're incredibly lucky. We have 100% of the world's Fortune 100 brands use our products. So it's going in and working with, you know, the who's who of, of being able to help them do better design, of doing better, you know, having their design teams be more effective. And then kind of getting to play the role of Robin Hood, of, of having this interesting, extremely broad industry view and be able to take from a lot of this design rich and then, you know, through um, some of the consulting work that, that my team and I do, through some of the, the public speaking, be able to go back and share those sort of best practices with everybody else. So, you know, on that note, uh, I think you said you're talking about opportunity for designers and uh, you, you brought the industrial revolution. Yeah. Uh, I think you, you said some, something, because uh, I've been talking to Julie Annixter, um, who's, who's uh, producing Fuse this year. Uh, you said something to the effect of there's such a tremendous amount of opportunity for designers out there. And right. we're basically blowing it. I mean, is that, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. I mean, it, again, I, what I would say is I feel like what's happened in a lot of the industry, especially with the rise of digital, is that we've seen an evolution from visual design to product design. And with that has come a lot of new challenges. With it's come the ability to speak to strategy, to product, to technology, to executives, to KPIs, and to, to business outcomes, and a lot of other things that nobody ever taught us in art school. And, and because of that, I think people are struggling. And, and even a few weeks ago, you know, we released what was the world's largest look at the state of design maturity ever done. It's about 77 times bigger than what some of the other consultancies have done it and, and the numbers bear it out that whenever you look at the, the state of how mature our design organizations one is the lowest and that's basically the make it look pretty five is the highest kind of core to business strategy you see 83 percent of the industry sits in the middle to the bottom yeah and i think you know this is the fact that you know we are struggling to break through and to take advantage of this moment and, and i think you know for me that's the urgency and changing roles, not having, this is the first time I've never had a designer or head of design title, because I do, I, there's a bit of a fear for me that, you know, design and creativity are, are having a moment. We see chief design officers, we see these roles popping up, but we're not breaking through. Or when we do, it's in very few places. And that, you know, as with most things, you know, you'll start to get very large investments, but if they don't start to pay back into the business, the investments go other places. So I think that's why for me, we, we are having a moment. We are having, there's an unprecedented, unprecedented demand. Our ability to deliver and to break through on that still has a ways to go. So, I mean, uh, I, I would say I'm, I'm probably, uh, not probably, I'm, I'm definitely in that 80% uh, you're talking about, uh, my position, my company. I mean, I've, I've had a seat at the table with the CEO, I've, I've presented, I've, I've put business ideas, uh, in, in front of our executive team, I put uh, business plans there. Um, there's, you know, it hasn't been all wonderful for me. Uh, there's been a bit of a struggle there. But, you know, what, when you're talking about, because it, did you say we're blowing it? Like, because that kind of puts the onus on us. And I, believe me, I'm, I'm not one to play victim. Um, well, I mean, I, I think it's both, right? I, I think, we are, inside of most corporations, what we do is a very different animal, right? Because I think in many cases, even just fundamentally the way that we operate, 
our ability to sort of jump off a cliff, build our wings on the way down with the certainty that we will figure out an idea before we kind of wile a coyote into the bottom. Right. That, that ability to be comfortable being uncomfortable is something that is not often shared by people in technology and product by in executives, right? That sort of faith and trust um, isn't a shared sort of thing. And, and I think, but if you look at the companies that are, you know, the higher design maturity and, and also on average, the ones that are higher design maturity, their valuation is about 26 times what the ones that are low design maturity are. Like the numbers right there get actually fairly staggering on what the impact can be. I've, I've seen those figures from like Design Management Institute. Yeah. Uh, pretty and, clear, yeah. And, and I, but I think that we, we have to understand that we are the ones who are probably gonna need to do the education. We need to be the ones that need to use inclusive methodologies like design thinking or design sprints to bring other people to the table. We need to be the ones that are guiding these conversations. Our ability to just sort of keep doing the things the way that we've been doing and kind of going off, you know, like we're wearing a beret doing a watercolor of our spirit animal or something saying that you don't understand and we're gonna come back and give a presentation on it doesn't work, right? Like the, the state of yeah. business has just simply evolved. And so, you know, I because and the reason why I, I will use the word I or we and will include myself in that whenever I, we need to do better is the fact that I think, you know, that's the one thing we can control. Yeah. Is that we can control us and we can control how do we take this stuff on and we can control how do we bring people in because the thing that we have on our side is everybody's creative. Most of us have just forgot. Like one of the companies I work with is Fisher Price. Whenever you go to Fisher Price, you go into their play lab, you'll see a room full of boys, right? Like somebody's um, a superhero, somebody's a plumber, somebody's a painter, somebody's in a boa, like, you know, and wearing heels, right? right. Everybody's creative, but the problem is over time, our education, our jobs, our society has basically told us that that's not a viable or you're not good at that, right? Like creatives are the kids that survive. Yeah. And so our ability to remind people of that, but it's also where I think we need to take a broader look at our value. And in many cases, I will coach teams on understanding the difference between design and creativity. Creativity is our true value, right? Creativity is our ability to solve problems, which is something that every company needs. Design is then the visual expression of the solution. Design, the problem is, is it is highly debatable and it is commoditized because if the value of your team is just design, executives don't see the value in it. Whereas yeah. if you can say, hey, I can help you solve any problem. Like one of my greatest moments was at Citibank. And what we did was we were teaching design thinking to the company. And I walked in to a conference room. And the way that we were teaching it, and it's a fairly famous statement for whenever you're doing design thing, is use how might we statements to launch a brainstorm. And on the whiteboard in there was written, how might we have a great baby shower? And it may seem like such a small thing, but what it said to me was that the team, who was not a design team, who was on a different floor from mine, who did not use that, saw the value in design thinking and that way of creative working that it transcended work. To the point where even whenever they wanted to throw a baby shower, they used it. And so that's what I mean. So for me, like we can be these amazing like Trojan horses for change if we can figure out how to actually pull it off. Okay. Um, I know you went to Syracuse. Did you, um, did you have Professor Giordano? Do you remember him? No, I didn't. Okay. But he was, I just, I remember his art class. He, he spoke about um, all kids draw and paint and color but by age 13 most kids stop and the right. people who continue after age 13 be, become the artist the creative so uh, you you right. had mentioned that but so um you recently you published a, a podcast about politics right mm -hmm. um so for fuse this year one of the themes is creating that dialogue with uh, business leadership um you know i know this is like maybe a complex question, but is there any one piece of advice you might have for a designer who's finds themselves in this situation? You know, like I, my own personal, yeah. career, I've had these conversations with the, the executive suite. Uh, they can come and go, you know, sometimes it's just that opportunity and you know, you might not, you might not get the chance with them anymore. My, my executive team's in London, so that's a little more difficult for us here, but any one piece of advice yeah, I mean, I think like on the one hand, you know, politics are challenging because it's an interpersonal skill development that, that you need to be able to work with other people, right? And, and I think that whenever you do that, that can be challenging, especially because the people who 
the people who do that, um, you know, vary so wildly. What, whether they're really collaborative, really, whether they're sort of standoffish, and a lot of the different things like that, right? I, and I think that that can get really sort of difficult. I mean, the, the thing for me and the one piece of advice that I always have is that I think, especially if you're working on in-house teams, are really to be able to get any piece of creative out the door and not get it neutered down, not get it beat up too much, you need support. And so for me, there's a lot of, you know, really looking at how do you go out and build sincere connections with people? How do you find support? How do you find, you know, because I think that if it's, if, if it's an idea that a single person carries, it's very, very, it's much easier to sort of rough it up and beat it up. If, if, it's, a, if it's an idea that an army carries, yeah. it tends to stay intact much more easily. So I think, you know, your ability to do that and, and then in doing it, looking at, you know, sort of what are your personal skills, mainly focusing on how do you manage your differences. So when you don't agree on something, like I actually think fighting is healthy, but you know, how do you do it in a way where it is still productive? I think also how do you manage agreement whenever you agree on something to make sure that the work still gets pushed really well. And then kind of how do you do all of that by maintaining your personal integrity? Because I, you know, I think a lot of us have seen and especially large organizations, yeah. There are some pretty senior people who can exist on pretty much just their skills of hitting deadlines and kissing executive butt. And, you know, those are really difficult people to deal with. But I think, you know, for me to, to be unafraid of, of talking to an executive, of trying an idea, because the thing that when it comes to politics for me is that in many cases, and I guess I've just found this in my career, again, it goes back to the crazy concept. You know, in so many cases, when you want to do something different, people will vilify you, they'll make fun of you, that they'll judge you for wanting to do something different. But the amazing part is, as soon as that idea finds any success, those same people will seek you out for the exact same reason. Right. Because you're the one that's willing to go against the status quo to run up the hill whenever nobody else will. And that that's, again, I think where we tend to really flourish is our ability to, to do those sort of things. And so, you know, again, I think that's the part of it for me of politics is like, Go get into fights, right? Like, go fight for what matters, but know what hill to die on, right? Like, there's there's a difference between crazy and stupid. Right, right. Um, uh, you talked a lot in that particular podcast. You you talked a lot about power, and um, it just struck. Have you ever heard of um, Jordan Peterson? Yeah, you heard of this guy? So he, mm -hmm. he he's got he's like all the range now um, in podcast land. Um, but he, he wrote this book about um, 12 rules for life, but he talked a lot about um, hierarchies. And um, one of the things that struck me about when I heard him talk was the difference between a power hierarchy and a competence hierarchy. Right. Uh, you want to avoid those power hierarchies because that's when things get ugly and nasty. Right. Um, the uh, hierarchy of competence um, is really what we all want to preserve. So, right. Um, anyways, I just, when no, I, and I, yeah, and I think, yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I've often described it as sort of like hard power and soft power. But yeah. But yeah. Hard, you know, hard power comes out of org charts. Um, hard power comes out of, you know, who has an office and who doesn't like there, there, it tends to be very visible displays of power, um, which, yeah, I think are the ones that you tend to want to avoid the, the soft power for me is, is sort of what what short circuits the org chart, right? It's, it's the, who are the people that can get stuff done. That maybe it is somebody who does have a much smaller title, but has a lot of influence or to be able to do those sort of things. Yeah, that, that I think that it's sort of understanding and seeing the organization in those terms. So yeah. that again, you can sort of understand where, where do you place certain things and, and how do you go about it? Interesting. I'm, I'm just thinking of like this Steve Wozniak and in, in relation to uh, Steve Jobs kind of thing. Um, Anyways, um, yeah, which is interesting because I've actually, you know, through my talks, I've actually been able to spend time with Waz and, and be able to talk to him about Steve and be able to talk to him about, you know, what that was. And, and I think the interesting part was even whenever you talk to him, he'll talk about how, you know, Steve needed to get fired the first time. Like he, because again, he was so into his vision and it was more of kind of like the hard power model and it was going to be what he wanted to sort of blinding it at everybody that he needed, he needed to be fired because he, he wasn't a good leader. Yeah. And that it was only after he got fired, it was only after he sort of ate crow, found a next and came back. That was when sort of the legend of Steve really started because then he came back and did things totally differently. He saw the world 
totally differently that, you know, the run up until that, like even with the Mac and all that other stuff, you know, cause again, I've been, I've been wildly lucky to have worked with a lot of people over the years who, who work with Steve and will tell you stories after a little while. But yeah, I think at first there was again, needing to be able to do that shift because I think what his brilliance was in that organization was his ability to cut across lanes, was ability, his ability to cut through the BS to be able to just get that company to focus on what mattered. Interesting. I mean, um, yeah, I'm just thinking about the, the relationship of the two. When I saw Steve Wozniak speak, he was talking, you know, clearly this guy has some competence to him. I mean, there's he's oh, like yeah. genius level competence. And he, he, he was talking about some of the situations he had with uh, Steve Jobs and how it would bring him to tears, like mm -hmm. some of the ways he was, Steve Jobs treated him. But, uh, you know, just kind of that, um, you know, I just find that there's like a real kind of that relationship, like you couldn't have one without the other type of a thing. No, and, and I think, you know, yeah, I think, you know, I would definitely say I feel like, you know, the media is definitely miscast was as sort of being this kind of like funny, slightly dumpy, and that's just not who he is. Yeah. Um, no, and I think, you know, it's interesting because that was one of the questions I specifically asked him about was, you know, Steve sort of famously being an asshole, firing people in the elevator. And, and you know, his response was that he, everybody who was around Steve understood why he was doing it and that he was pushing for the best. And that in, in his own sort of, again, that reality distortion field, you know, if he went to somebody and he felt like you weren't doing your best work or this wasn't what you were meant to do, he wanted, he wanted, one, he didn't want you on the team because he felt like you were somehow slowing them down. But then, you know, in this weird way, he felt like he was freeing you up to then go pursue what that was. But no, I, I think that you definitely need both of those. And that's why I said, I think that's why whenever Steve came back, yeah, often he was different. You know, Waz was sort of the counterbalance, I think, in the early days. And then as he sort of spun off, he had to sort of reassess for whenever he would then come back. Interesting. Um, maybe he was firing people, giving, doing them the favor that, uh, that he went through, I guess. Uh, who knows? But <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I said. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty on. And that's what I said. Because whenever you have that sort of success, you're forgiven a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, moving on, this year marks the 100th year of the uh, anniversary of the Bauhaus School of mm -hmm. Design in, uh, created in Germany. Um, you know, I've heard you say stuff like design isn't isn't just about making things pretty anymore. So, right. Oh, we're we're trying to kind of celebrate the Bauhaus, and we're also I'm, I'm asking all these folks like what what's different to, today for designers um, or about a designer's role in the world than a hundred years ago? What's what's the same? What's different? You know, I think in a lot of cases it it it's the same. It's just industries go through maturation processes because I think you know when you, as you look at the emergence of digital kind of everything, um, you know, in, in in the early days it was much more about sort of the the visual piece of it of what was the expression of just our our ability to create design. And then I think as as that sort of matured, and I think sort of in in line with kind of what happened with the Bauhaus was that as you start to see that sort of shift from visual design to product design, it is about how do we make something that is really functional, but how can we also make it beautiful? How can we make it simple and elegant? How can we be able to do that? But, but there is real functionality to it. Again, I think that's why, you know, as you look at a lot of Herman Miller furniture, it is timeless. If you look at, at Dieter Ram's designs, yeah, again, it is timeless because there are a lot of those things where they, just the functionality and the beauty of it, is undeniable and I think that that's the best of what you've seen happen with product design with, with with so many other phases and it's this sort of looping cycle and for whatever reason every time we go through it we all seem to feel like we're invent we're finding it for the first time but no I, I think that you know it's it's I'll often joke that you know I always still think that like when Gutenberg invented the printing press his best friend was standing next to him going now content's going to really be king you know, and here we are having many iterations of the written word later, and we're still having the same problem. So, yeah, that's why I said this. I think it's a little bit of that. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think there's any piece of um, digital design? I know, I know you spent so much, like, doing app design, website design, this kind of thing. Is there, I, I just came up with this thought, is there a digital design out there that you think is going to be timeless? Or No, no. I mean, I, I've said that for forever. Like, MoMA's never going to have a show of, like, the greatest website designs, right? right? Because I think, 
our, the way that we consume it and the way that we judge it has just changed so drastically. Because, you know, it, maybe you'll hold on to like old flash books or something ironically, but it, it's not, an, it, the, the design isn't as timeless because I, I think we're going to get to a place where we're starting to see that in product design. We may start to see that in digital design a little bit more because it's re reached a point of maturation where it may become a little bit more timeless. Uh, but you know, again, aside from like, you know, the Wayback Machine or something like that, there aren't really repositories that go back and celebrate because I think, you know, with digital, we, we, we really celebrate the new and it's who get theirs first, who does it. I mean, again, this is the problem that we have is that, you know, because of that, people now officially have a shorter attention span than goldfish. Like, well, it's, it's almost like designing digital. It's not even in reality, right? You know, it's, right. there's like a level of abstraction to it. Well, no, and that's what, like, that's, that's the part of it, right? Is because I think, you know, the object, the smartphone, the laptop, those will be celebrated as pieces of industrial design because of their physicality. But because you know the, the pixels and a lot of these things are so sort of transient, you know, it, I think what people will remember out of that are great experiences, right? And, and so for me, it's not necessarily the design as much as, again, the experience they created because it's why retro video games, you know, it's why you can still go play Donkey Kong all these different places. It's why you can still do a lot of those sort of things. And so I think if it's something that created a great experience, that then those were, those are then associated to memories, those are associated, because again, most people remember the first time they used visual voicemail or the first time they sent a text or the first time, you know, and, and I think you start to see that that's where we've sort of reshaped the relationship between brands and advertising and things like that, where it's not about buying eyeballs as much anymore that shapes a brand. It's about, Uber, you watching that little car to come and get you. It's about Airbnb, your ability to go explore. It's about Netflix, about streaming it on the device, right? So I think those are going to be the things that are going to be more remembered because they were these iconic experiences. Of, and then the design was just, again, what brought it to life. Um, last question here. So, um, again, for Fuse this year, we're partnering with um, Vernon Lockhart, who's lead of Project Osmosis in Chicago. And uh, I, I spoke to him this week as well. Really cool program. I, I don't know if you're familiar, but he's, um, it's a whole group of folks that they're bringing kids in. Um, I, I guess some off the streets of Chicago and they're putting them in an environment where they can paint and draw, uh, mm -hmm. design, uh, learn Adobe software skills, etc. This is kind of the opposite end of, you know, where folks like you and me are. That, what advice do you have for, let's say, young and up, up and coming, uh, crazy ones? As a yeah, no, it's interesting. It's something I've been thinking about a lot because um, at the end of the month, I'm going to go speak at the National Student Design Show in Dallas, um, and it's getting some of the top young designers from, you know, all over the world to be able to kind of say, okay, I mean, it's interesting. I think I'm trying to come to grips with sort of being the person that is now at a point to be able to reflect back to an audience like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that a lot of it for me with, with younger designers is, is to understand what your process is, right? Because I, I think, you know, it's amazing to me how many designers I speak with in all stages of their life, and I ask them two very simple questions. Most of the time, they cannot answer. I, I think, you know, the first one is, one, can you tell me how you have an idea? Like, have you spent enough time to actually think about how do you summon your creativity on demand? What, what do you do? what you know what makes you different and can you get faster at that and i think the other thing is can you tell me what you need to be happy and it's been interesting as, as i've interviewed people over the years I, i've had people who come back two three days later and said they haven't slept at all because they don't know the answer to those questions but but i think you know the, the cycle is as you go through as you study the psychology of creativity we start by mimicking other people and at the point whenever we start to find our voice at the, the point where we start to you know figure out where that crazy is is a really hard and interesting inflection time. And I think for a lot of young designers, as you start to step out of that, it's trying to find what is your voice in the world. And so for me, it is to really encourage them to like focus on originality, to focus on their crazy, right? Like a cover band never changed the world. That, you know, we need, while it may feel very safe and very comfortable to do what everybody else is doing, confidence is, comes from doing things that you are uncomfortable with, from pushing the boundary, from trying something new from being able to put yourself in a place where they value ideas, not execution. Um, and so again, I think, you know, that's a lot of it for me is, is the ability to focus on 
those things because I think as I look back over my career, having worked across print and broadcast and branding and digital and you know everything in between, those are the things that are timeless, right? Like our ability to have ideas, our ability to work with and inspire others, our ability to understand what consumers are going through and the ability to maybe kind of see a little bit further than where they're at. No matter what technology changes, no matter what happens, the human condition will stay timeless to, to allow us to continue to function in that way. So I think, you know, setting it on those often will lead to much better than, again, trying to look at the tools because that's what we said is like, you know, for a, so, such a long time, everybody, it was future splash, then it was, you know, then it was macromedia flash, then Adobe flash, then it was a dead end career, right? Like that, that will continue to happen and, and things are going to continue to evolve. So, you know, but, but again, the, the human condition that we're talking to, that's where the real power is. Uh, you know, it, I mean, tell me if you agree, cause I'm just, I'm just thinking as you're talking, um, the the analogy you made like jumping off the cliff and and creating the wings yeah. as you're falling i mean when i told my parents i wanted to go to art school you know it was like um that was tough and yeah. i i mean both my parents are gone now but they they made the decision to support me going to art school right which was i think the greatest gift they ever gave me i don't think they fully understood you know <laughs> And um, yeah, but to their credit, like it was, it was painful and that was scary. But I was making that choice to to make that leap into a creative career. And I think when you do that, when you you have to be creative, you have to say, all right, well, it's all me. I have to figure out how this. Well, that's is. but that but that's the challenge, right? Is that how we all have ideas is unique to us. Yeah. How you connect the dots, how I connect the dots, is different. And, and I think that this is why it is for me and, and sort of the call that I tend to send out a lot to the more senior members of the community is to be clear and to share more about what that journey looks like. Because I think for too many of us, we fetishize the beginning and the end. We love the two guys in the garage and we love whatever we can put in our portfolios, Pinterest, Dribble, Behance, whatever else, right? Like we love that and we don't talk about the middle. And as a result, we're, we're getting a generation of creatives where for the first time ever, we're seeing a decline in creativity in children. Because so much of it is about consuming, not about creating. And it's so much of it is whenever it comes to uncertainty, they aren't sure what to do. And so your creativity is actually suffering. And so, no, I think, you know, that the, the where did, where did story you that, that I don't. Hmm? Where did you see that st statistic, the drop of creativity? It was, it was in it was Harvard Business Review like a year or two ago where they said it was for the first time ever they'd seen a decline in creativity in children. Wow. Most attributed to basically the rise of consumption in media yeah. that, where it used to be you take your action figures and you go out and play in the backyard. Now you just watch the TV show. And, you know, so again, that, that is, it's having a, a real effect on what's going on there. But no, I mean, I, and the reason why I say that is, is I think very much for the story that you had with your parents. I mean, I had, an, I had something that happened to me a few years ago, which candidly is why I started my podcast. And I don't tell the story a whole lot because it's a little bit difficult to tell, but I think, you know, I, I, it was the, whenever I decided I was going to start, being more personal. I was going to start talking about my struggles. I was going to start talking about, you know, again, what I was going through. And I did it at a big event in Europe. And a kid, young designer came up to me afterwards and was talking about how, you know, sort of like yours, like his parents didn't understand what they were. They were in finance. They didn't really kind of agree at all with what it was he was doing to the point where like, you know, they told him if he goes and becomes a designer, they were going to cut him off. Yeah. Like pretty much just alienate him from his family. And he started to cry which is never the reaction you want when you talk to somebody. And I asked him what was wrong. And he said, like, it was such a struggle for him. And he felt so alienated that the talk I gave was the first time he felt like he'd found his tribe and the first time he'd heard a story that he could relate to. And the reason why that was so important was because he'd sold most of everything he owned to buy the ticket to go to this conference. And at the end of it, he decided that either he was going to go and become creative or he was going to go outside of town and kill himself. And that because he'd heard somebody who was going through what he was going through, he decided he was going to go become a designer and go, you know, kind of against his whole family. And so that's why for me, like everybody that's out there, I don't care if you feel like your, your story has value or not, you need to share it. Like what we're going through is so unique. What we're doing is so different that that's why, again, I think sharing this stuff is so important, not just sharing the successes, right? Like really getting in and let's talk about, you know, some of these harder subjects. And I think that's sort of what's driven me over the past few years to talk about what I do is to get to that next young designer, to get to that kid I may never meet, to get to whatever that is, because 
you know, we are in this sort of time of creativity and crisis. And, and again, I think it's up to those of us who are a little further down the road to figure out how do we deal with it. Um, uh, you're giving me chills here. I just very, I relate a lot to that story you just told. And, it, and it's funny, you know, coming full circle, I know we were talking before the recording about, uh, you know, I've been in this job for a very long time. I've, I've gotten so much stability and security from this job and I, and I have my own children and, uh, you know, I'm paying the bills and, and I got money to spare and I, I got a, my wife at home. And um, I don't think I ever thought I would be living the life I'm living. Yeah. And um, with pursuing a creative career. And I think um, this is part of probably you know, what's kept me, kept me here. It's like, I don't want to let it go. But, um, so I'm going to be doing some more soul searching. We'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think we'll all, I think we're, we're all there with it, right? And I, I think the more, the more that we can find the support for each other, the more that we can openly talk about these conversations, the more we can kind of cut through this sort of curated BS that, that so much of social media drives then I think then we start to break through. Then I think we start to be able to get to that other side. And, and I think that that's where we can kind of help each other is, is in sort of sharing more of these sort of things. Um, Cause that's a, every company is dysfunctional. Every creative somehow feels broken. Like I, I travel all over the world. You name it, who it is. I probably talk to them, help them coach them. It's all the same. Well, and I've, and, I've talked to enough CEOs. I mean, this, I've had a unique experience in that way. I've talked to, I mean, maybe hundreds of CEOs. I've talked to lots of CEOs, and guess what? They're the same way. They they feel insecure. They got court. Uh, you know, they piss off their 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 spouses and their kids, and you know, they got problems. And um, so it's interesting. I I really love the format of the podcast because you can you know you, you just have this direct dialogue, and it's to me it's I listen to a lot of podcasts now. Uh, it's so refreshing in comparison to a lot of the stuff that's out there. So, um, well, yeah. And I think, cause that, that, that's the one. And again, and that's why I sort of bring it up is because I think it's the one thing that I find strange and almost frustrating is that the number one comment I get from people is thank you for being honest and being transparent. If those are qualities that are different yeah. than what most communication is in this industry, we've got a real problem. Right. And, and I think that that's why for me, you know, it, it is sort of kind of taking up that rally cry because, yeah, I think it is important to be able to do these things, to be able to have events like these, to be able to have places like this where we can come together and have that kind of conversation and then go back and share it out, you know, with, with everybody that's going on and going through that. Because as we said, if we can shorten somebody else's journey, then it's all worth it. Yeah, I uh, agreed. It reminds me of a Mark Twain quote. I think it was, uh, if you want to if you want to be an eccentric, live a virtuous life. I, I think most, more of us lie than we care to admit. And, you know, yeah. I think you take this journey where you're trying to truly be honest and own yourself. Like my wife, a couple of weeks ago, she's like, you know, you really play a victim. You know, she's, <laughs> and, um, you know, I made a choice. Normally I get a defensive or whatever. And I'm sitting there. I was like, you know, she's, she's probably right. And uh, that's, so, that's so painful to just say, you know, I, I probably play a victim. Um, it's not a, it's not a nice thing to, to kind of say to yourself, but I remember that and I'm going to grow from that. Um, and that's, right. and it's not, you know, it's not pleasant, but it's honest. Right. Well, I think that, that, that ability to sort of be courageously candid and, and to make it into a discussion, not a statement are, are often the defining factors of a lot of those moments for how do you kind of come out of them and grow from them? Yeah. Well, um, we've gone on for, quite some time and I really appreciate I know what a busy busy guy you are so very very appreciative uh really enjoyed this uh this chat and um what are you speaking uh, on at Fuse it's a couple of weeks yeah. now so yeah I mean Fuse um I'm going to be opening up the conference I think you know for me it, it's going to be on this probably being a little bit of a therapist a little bit of a provocateur a little bit of a uh I don't know maybe a bit of an interventionist around this sort of topic of you know, as we look at design leadership, as we look at some of these things, what is our role? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? You know, what are some of these challenges that are out there? Uh, because I, you know, I tend to really love and enjoy being able to lead off an event like this because I think you're able to kind of set the theme and set some questions that I think hopefully people will be able to sort of explore in their own way um, as we go through the whole thing. So yeah, it'll be, um, 
it's going to be interesting. It's really going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a little bit, uh, it's going to be a new talk for me, but I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Stephen Gates. Thanks so much. Sure thing. We'll see you soon. All right.